Coming up on Smart Tech Today, Matthew Casanelli and I have a packed show for you. We start by talking about smartwatches. There's Garmin's new watch, Wythings gets an update, the Fitbit has some new features and a user interface update, plus so much more. Then smart gear, including the new garage door opener from LiftMaster, my complaints about Keurig, and Google, Google, Google. All that and so much more coming up on Smart Tech Today. Smart Tech Today is brought to you from Twit's LastPass Studios. You're focused on security, but are your employees? Well, LastPass can ensure that they are by making access and authentication seamless, whether employees are working in the office or remotely. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Twit. This episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online privacy with one click. Yes, it's that easy. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash STT. And by Molecule. Molecule is reimagining the future of clean air, starting with the air purifier. It's not just an innovation on existing technology, but a scientific breakthrough in air purification. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit Molecule.com and enter code STT. Welcome to Smart Tech Today, where we explain the exciting, the dynamic, and the sometimes confusing subject that is the Internet of Things. I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Matthew Casanelli. Hello, Micah. How are you doing today? I am doing well today. Um, I've got a new machine uh, after some troubles and issues and problems with my former uh, MacBook Pro. Um, I've got a different audio interface. I've got uh, a smile in my heart and a twinkle in my eye. So (laughs) I'm ready to just take on the world today. I've got a whole new desk set up in office layout. And also yeah, <laughs> a mic arrangement thing. So hopefully there's no issues there. But yeah, it's a whole new world for both of us, I guess. A dazzling place, I tell you. <laughs> um, we've got a lot to talk about, though. So we should go ahead and get rolling along. And the first one uh, comes from Garmin, which has announced a new wearable. Uh, the Garmin. Oh, goodness. I forgot the name. new SQ. Yeah, it's <laughs> there's a whole host of smartwatches to talk about today. So I've got sticky notes in front of me with all of the names and prices and things like that, because <laughs> there's a nice. lot to talk about. Um, yeah, but I mean, what this is, this is uh, it's a it's definitely clearly a uh, an act activity focused uh, smartwatch given the look and feel of it it's it reminds me of um, a, a rubberized watch that I would wear uh, to go swimming in or something like that something that definitely looks like it can what is it uh, take a licking and keep on ticking as it were <laughs> um, but along with doing that I think that they've done a good job of offering some uh, customizations to the design that make it still feel a bit like a fashion piece. It's, Mm -hmm. I would say, halfway between a Fitbit and an Apple Watch in terms of uh, fashion versus fitness, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's definitely more towards the, I'd say it's more like the fitness versus health. Like a, a Fitbit is more of a health smartwatch and then the Garmin is kind of like you want the GPS you want all of the data it's it's kind of just like a different target I'd say like Fitbit is a more casual user and uh, my friend who was a runner was always like I'm going to go for the Garmin stuff so it's got continuous heart rate which is cool blood oxygen respiration and hydration tracking I don't exactly know if that just means water tracking or something else with the sensor specifically but it licks your battery. sweat and then goes, hmm, <laughs> too salty. Yeah. Uh, Six-day battery, GPS, and yeah, water resistant. And it's only 200 bucks, so that seems pretty solid. Hey, that's actually, yeah, so that's a pretty good price point um, for the Venue SQ. Uh, and I, I don't know, I kind of, if I was 
working on my fitness um, and I did not exist solely in the Apple uh, ecosystem, I think that I could s- very well see this being a, a smartwatch that I would look into. I really like that orchid color, um, the orchid finish. And yeah, as you mentioned, it's got um, the some some of those tracking features that you sort of take things a step farther than just, I can tell you what your steps are. And if you've fallen asleep and uh, it can still do those basic health or not basic health, but basic uh, smart watch deals, though, uh, including, you know, giving you your your text messages and things like that. So um, it looks like as a hydration tracker, it just uh, it says log your daily fluid intake as a reminder to stay hydrated. You can even have an auto goal for hydration that adjusts based on how much you sweat based on how much sweat you lose during activities. So it may do some sweat tracking maybe, uh, but it sounds like most of that is just, hey, don't forget to drink water and you kind of tell it. Uh, The respiration tracking though actually is monitoring you, which is kind of cool. Um, And it has Mm -hmm. uh, mindfulness built in as well. So there are some features that maybe take things a step farther than uh, what we've expect or what we've seen with some of the other smartwatches, which is nice. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, it's a very, it's okay. I was going to say it's a very crowded market, but that's not even the right thing to say. Um, it's a very captured market, captive Mm -hmm. market. And so that's what makes this interesting. If I go out into the world, I see two brands of wearable it's Apple watch and it's Fitbit. And so I don't see a whole lot of these other ones. And so if I'm going to spend $200, am I going to spend $200 on uh, this other brand versus taking that money and using it on a Fitbit, which is quickly becoming or going to become, if it's not already, Android's kind of wearable space? Or am I going to take that money and apply it toward an Apple Watch and go that route with it? This is this is hard, but I do like that there's you know other stuff out there for sure. Mm-hmm. I think it's it is one of those things that <laughs> at least you have some choice. Like if you don't want Google's thing, then you can go with somebody else that isn't just one of the major brands. Um, and there is a why things one also is the next story here. The scan yeah, watch. Yeah, what's called? Scan uh, watch. Yeah, this sounds like Mr. Game and Watch to me, but um, <laughs> Mr. It's like Game a, and Watch. Oh no, and play Smash Bros. I feel like these were one of the sets that I saw, like walking around CES, and I kind of was at the time. I remember thinking that these all seemed very similar, but I think even with um, I have the I don't even remember what the scale is called now because it's been rebranded like five times. But the smart scale that. It went Y Things to Nokia and back to Y Things, I think, because they didn't do anything with the brand. But um, it does, in my mind, even I associate it with sleep tracking and weight tracking type of thing in a more hardware type of way. So they now have a watch that will let you do all that type of sleep tracking stuff and also look like a watch. Like I definitely, I think this was the only one that I stopped to look at because it looked like a watch and not like it's a chunky so, smart watch. Yeah. Wythings does a good job with the hardware design. It is a gorgeous watch. And it is, you know, I, I sort of not joked, but said that if I didn't exist on Apple's platform, then the venue SQ, if I was super into fitness, I'd be into that. Just even being on Apple's platform and loving my Apple watch, I have ogled and eyeballed the... Um, the Wythings series of smartwatches all the time um, because of just how beautiful they are. And they really do just look like an actual watch and it's Mm -hmm. not anything, um, you know, they don't, they don't overdo the design and it's just a beautiful watch. And I kind of wish that, that I, um, I don't know that I had the need. I, no, I don't. I, I was going to say I kind of wish that I had the need for a watch on both wrists, but that's just silly. My point is, this is a really beautiful um, 
piece of hardware. And I'm glad that Wythings is doing this for folks that kind of want to have a little bit of that smart watch stuff, but really want to be carrying mm-hmm. the, the classic um, look and feel of, of a watch. Unfortunately, uh, nobody seems to be doing blood oxygen to the level that it needs to be done. And yeah. this fits <laughs> into that as well. That seems a common thread that they're good for measuring it, but whether or not the data points are consistent measure to measure has been sort of a test. So we'll see. I think it's maybe at least even just thinking at all about what blood oxygen means for you and the general trend. I think that's a huge point that I saw somebody on Twitter asking about why do you even need this? And it's it's another data point that when you look back at all of your info, you can kind of correlate. Like I actually mm-hmm. looked at my heart rate stuff and I noticed, um, I think in July I was more relaxed and then in August I was more stressed because of the way that I was doing my shortcuts catalog stuff and I just had a lot oh, of work wow. to do versus spending more time just being like having more free time basically. So I don't know. It was interesting looking back at like three years of data and it was like, oh yeah, that was, that was when I was kind of stressed and I didn't sleep as long or things like that. So I think it'll be worth measuring, but we got to get, it's got to get more accurate. Yeah. It needs to be good and right. Um, well, speaking of Fitbit, uh, there's Fitbit OS 5.0, which has some updates. Um, Interestingly, I think we we kind of talked about Fitbit and some of the updates that it would be getting and what um, what that meant for for future versions. And uh, there were some complaints that it wasn't going to be doing enough, so to speak. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, a lot of Fitbit watches, or I guess a lot of Fitbits is what you'd call them, um, won't be getting these new updates. So the Versa 2 yeah. and older uh, Fitbit Versas and Fitbit Senses aren't going to be getting these updates, um, which is kind of a bummer. But the newer ones, including the Fitbit Sense and Versa 3, which ship today, or excuse me, ship as of, um, oh, that's been, I guess that was what, last last Monday? Um, yeah. They will uh they will be getting this new Fitbit 5.0, which is cool. It's got a whole new typeface. Um, and I think kind of brings things in line with what one expects from a modern smartwatch, which of course is always a, a pro over a con. I mean, we whether you can bring new stuff is kind of uh, dependent more on the hardware and how much battery or if not battery, then performance you can pack into it. But uh, bringing things to parity or as close to parity as possible is always a good thing. And I think that's what Fitbit OS 5.0 kind of does. I think it's, yeah, this is kind of like the next iteration in the Fitbit line and kind of what you'll be getting forward as you upgrade. I did kind of write down, they were in the articles talking about how just only... The, these newer smartwatches are getting it. And I'm curious what the average lifespan of these is. Because even with Google, well, later Google announced, I mean, not too much about the Pixel because it's not totally smart tech, but um, those generally, they even promise in their marketing that you get three years of updates. And so I just find it fascinating, especially for smartwatches, that people tend to keep them a long time. And it'll be interesting to see if that length of time is going to be enough for people and they'll just be out of out of OS updates for a year or two before they upgrade or if it is going to spur them into this three-year cycle that Google seems to have for most of their products. So that'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, how about a smartwatch that only needs to charge twice a month? That sounds good, right? If you can mm-hmm. hold to that claim, because I don't know, I've heard that claim <laughs> from uh, security cameras and and other products that say, hey, you don't need to charge this very much or you don't need to put new batteries in it. But once a year or twice a year, Xiaomi says its new smartwatch only needs to be charged uh, twice a month. And yeah. it is <laughs> it is supposed to do that by... Um, kind of cutting down on 
the display's um, needs. Uh, so, so if you've got a display that isn't putting out as much uh, brightness and you don't do as much overall, then you can have a smartwatch that will um, that will only need to be charged twice a month. Interestingly, it's about a hundred sixteen dollars, um, which is of course much less money than most of these smartwatches that you can get in the United States, Fitbit, uh, Garmin, Apple Watch, etc. Um, and it's of course not available in the yeah. US. Uh, you'd have to get it imported that way. But it's for your friends. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's got heart rate, it's got blood oxygen, it's got sleep tracking. Um, I don't know how it can do all of this and only need to be charged twice a month, though. That's <laughs> that's what's weird to me. Um, and then also in gadget notes that the Apple Watch SE, so the kind of cost effective model that has less in it, weighs 36 grams. This one only weighs 32 grams. So hmm. less battery, but way more battery power. I mean, what are they doing? Are they taking yeah. energy from your blood? What they, how's this how's this supposed to only need to be charged twice a month? Hmm. Taking it. Um yeah, I mean, I think a big thing with is it it's Xiaomi? I know I never I know that that's how I'm, I should say I it, but I, I never actually pronounce it. Um, but I mean, it's in general they are known for being pretty clear knockoffs of Apple products. Like the faces of these look like if you squint a little bit, they look like the Apple Watch ones with even the Nike style um, text and things like that. And the those watch faces are the colors. So. I think it's kind of like an alternative if, especially outside of the U.S. market, you're not into the Apple realm or even, I mean, I think it could, it's always worth mentioning that low cost products that do heart rate tracking and blood monitoring means that people mm -hmm. who can't afford those things can get into the market well. So it's interesting to see. I think what's always just fascinating is if we'll ever see these guys in the U.S., but I'm pretty sure Apple would... <laughs> I mean, the whole yeah, knockoff they would have plus some copyright headphones issues with AirPods. Or yeah, trademark it's issues. like get blocked at the border. <laughs> I, I'm okay with, with uh, cost-effective models giving people access to technology that they may not otherwise have, but not if it's entirely inaccurate for yeah. the... If the reduction in cost leads to inaccurate um, uh, components... I have a problem with that and that's kind of what this that worries me. Um so I guess I'd be interested to see as these uh, are are shipped the reviews that come out of it and mm -hmm. how uh people feel about the Mi Watch. Um so I guess I'll be watching for that. Uh, uh tell me about this Gizmodo article <laughs> entitled um, Just Buy a Dang Smartwatch. <laughs> yeah. I think that's why I wanted to collect all these stories. And mention them in one place because especially with the Apple Watch Series 6 and all these options that are at least decent now, it seems like, and relatively affordable. There's a lot of people who probably held on a, on a smartwatch because it wasn't good enough or didn't appeal to them in a particular way. And this article is kind of a first person perspective of like, I finally got a watch and... It's great, especially during a lockdown situation where you want to be able to take care of your health. But self-motivating isn't always <laughs> just like possible when things are blowing up every day or every hour on the weekends like this last weekend. Um, so just having those friendly reminders and things like that is really good. And I like it. It's especially when there are analog or nice looking alternatives. It's like just buy, buy a smartwatch and take care of yourself more. Maybe you're not a watch person, but if there's ways that you can do that, it's highly recommended because they can be very helpful in life. So I agree. Um, my, my partner just got, uh, well, I, I got him an Apple watch for his birthday and, um, he has really enjoyed having it except it's really been fascinating watching his reaction to the activity and 
mindfulness uh, stuff. So I had to quickly show him how to turn those off because for him, it he felt like it was uh, sort of bossing him around where, you know, I the way that I experience it is a bit of guilt and a bit of suggestion. But for him, he felt it was kind of like telling him what to do. And he didn't like that, um, which is totally understandable <laughs> and reasonable. And so, you know, I showed him, OK, you know, you don't have to have that. You can shut it off. It's totally fine. Um, and I showed him how to shut it off. And I, I came to, you know, as I was talking to him and trying to understand his perspective, it came to be that his biggest issue was that, and this is something that I've seen from other folks kind of talking, this is a little bit specific, but I, I want to mention it. Um, the stand notifications were bothering him because he said, you know, I'm on my feet all day at work and walking mm -hmm. around and I know that I was standing all day. And so then I come home and I finally get to just sit down and not do anything. And mm -hmm. it's telling me to stand up. And I feel like it should know that I spent the last eight, 10 hours standing and don't need to be reminded to do it for the rest of the day. Um, and I think that that's completely reasonable. So basically, you know, as a whole, I think that these things are great for um, for making us more aware of our health. And I think that mm -hmm. they will continue. Continue, continue to improve by continuing to get better at understanding our health and being able to inform us about our health and get better at understanding our activity and our movements and things like that in order to improve upon that experience. So I'm looking forward to as more people get them, that also is going to lead to, you know, if you share, if you're sharing your, um, your diagnostics essentially, uh, which are privatized in Apple's case, um, that is also good because there's more data that gets sent and so they can better understand and model the different types of, of um, senses, sensor uh, categories, so to speak. So mm -hmm. knowing what someone standing and walking around feels like to an Apple Watch, knowing what someone washing their hands feels like uh, to properly make these tools work well as they, as they need to. So yeah, um, selfishly, I'm also excited for more people to get smartwatches because it means more data is available, which can lead to better, uh, better functionality for all of us. Nice. All right, let's take a quick break. Uh, another way to have better functionality for yourself is with express VPN. We all know how a VPN protects your privacy and security online, right? Of course we do. But did you know that it can take your TV watching to the next level by unlocking movies and shows that are only available in other countries. You can use ExpressVPN to binge on Doctor Who or Star Trek on the UK Netflix. It's simple. You just fire up the ExpressVPN app. You change your location to the UK. You refresh Netflix, and that's it. ExpressVPN hides your IP address and lets you control where you want sites to think you're located. You can choose from nearly 100 different countries. So just think about all the Netflix libraries you can go through. There are hundreds, hundreds of VPNs out there. But one of the reasons I use ExpressVPN is to watch shows. And that is because it is ridiculously fast, regardless of where you are checking in from. There's not buffering or lag other than what you would normally get as a show is loading. And you can stream in HD no problem. In fact, I used ExpressVPN right after watching Netflix's US version of The Circle. I wanted more from The Circle, and I knew it was a UK show. So I used ExpressVPN to uh, maybe trick the internet into thinking I was coming from the UK so I could watch the UK version of The Circle. And it was glorious and I loved it and I was very happy about it. And it was HD, high quality. Uh, if you visit the special link we have for you, that's expressvpn.com slash STT, you can get an extra three months of ExpressVPN for free. Support our show, watch what you want, and protect yourself at expressvpn.com slash STT. I got to tell you, ExpressVPN is wonderful because not only is it good at taking us to the different shows, but it is truly one of the only VPNs that puts its money where its mouth is in terms of the claims that it has about not logging your data, not tracking your data, not using that information. And 
I, I can't say enough about the privacy protections that are in place with ExpressVPN that you just simply cannot get from many of the VPNs that are online. Uh, you've got to check it out. ExpressVPN.com slash STT for an extra three months free. Thanks so much, ExpressVPN. All righty. Up first, LiftMaster's smart garage door opener. You know, this technology has not changed much uh, since its introduction, but I don't know. I think that's okay. Um, once you have a smart, once you have a garage door opener that connects to the internet and lets you open or shut the garage door and then also be notified that the garage door is open or shut, you wouldn't think that you'd need much more than that. But LiftMaster has a new one out uh, that they claim would ruin Ferris Bueller's day off because of how it works. It's got a built-in camera, two-way communication, and that way, not only can you use the camera to see oh, someone's in my garage, but you can also say, hey, I see you're in my garage. So essentially, they've taken a smart garage door opener and stuck a security camera into it and let it do both things. So I think this is great because there are a lot of um, built-in automations where you can have it so that when the garage door opens, the security camera that you have in your garage, separate from the garage door opener, will turn on and see who's coming in. Um, so it's clear that people have kind of already been doing this. So to have that all be uh, built in like that, I think is brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah. And the whole shtick of this commercial is they have two young guys who are going in and one of them, they're both playing the characters from Ferris Bueller and he's like, Oh, let's get my dad's car. And then the camera goes off and it, you, you hear like not so fast. And then it switches to, um, I forget the actor's name, but the guy who plays Cameron now as a dad and he's like been there, done that. And then it closes back on them. So it's <laughs> his kid can't steal his car. Like he stole his dad's because of this. He's too wise. Clever. I could totally see, like my dad has a whole garage woodworking setup and just like, I don't know, I just imagine him just looking, just being like, hmm, nice. Here's what I got set up. Or like <laughs> ch checking it out to make sure you didn't leave it. I guess you can just check with the smart thing, but um, just like where you left something or something like that. Before yeah, you exactly. Go out. <laughs> um, I, no, I think this is, like I said, I think this is a cool idea to have it all built into one device. Um, these tend to be a little bit pricey. But yeah. the technology is is when you think about the fact that if you buy any garage door opener, I mean, you're buying a, an engine um, or a motor, I should say. You're buying a motor. Um, you're buying a contraption that has a chain of some sort. I mean, it's it's a when it's, it's hardware with a capital H, and so there's price involved. Um, so to have this added onto it, I think it makes sense and it, it's it's understandable why um, it would cost as much as it does. But I do like, I like the idea of let me just buy one thing and then my garage is taken care of. If I'm going to do the smart thing in my garage, uh, let me just have the yeah, one deal exactly. be the, the smart thing. Uh, because right now I've got a security camera, I've got a garage, a, a garage door opener that came with the apartment and I've connected a smart garage door opener to it. And so there's all this stuff kind of on my ceiling and in the garage. And if I could just get mm -hmm. one thing that does all of that, and particularly if I wanted to, um, to recommend a product for somebody who's like, I want to make sure that my garage is safe. And I also want to be able to check my garage whenever I'm away from it. Um, my uncle I can think of is somebody who, uh, would benefit from something like this cause he's got a huge tool, you know, I don't, I don't know what it's called. Like all of his tools are in his garage, a lot of them. And so to have all of that built in would be, uh, quite nice. So do you have a sticky for how much this one is? Uh, I do not. Sorry. Those are all the smart watches. <laughs> Let me see. Yeah, they um, don't. The most recent one, smart garage door with built-in camera, live streaming 1080p HD. Oh, it looks like it also does. Um, it, pan, it can pan. That's kind of nice. 
Uh, available for, I don't see, shop now. <laughs> Maybe they don't know the price. I don't know. Dealers near me. Find a Liftmaster dealer. <laughs> I think they don't want to have a list Yeah, we price. can update it. Yep. Yeah, we'll have to figure that out. Um, oh, and th- see, there are two brands, um, Liftmaster and Chamberlain own both Liftmaster and Chamberlain. Excuse me. Chamberlain owns both Liftmaster and Chamberlain, uh, as well as some other uh, home brands. But those ones are kind of the big ones. And I think, I thought Chamberlain was the um, contractor group and Liftmaster was the consumer group, but it might be the other way around. It might be that Liftmaster is the um, contractor group and Chamberlain is the sort of homeowner consumer group. But anyway, regardless of which one's which, you might not be able to get it except through a dealer because it's uh, a contractor version. Um, but yeah, I imagine it's going to be quite pricey is uh, kind of what I'm nice. getting at there, <laughs> uh, which, you know, shouldn't be a surprise because of all of the technology that's built into it. Uh, but I think that this is a great all in one package uh, to do all the things that you wanted to do. Maybe that's why they used a Jaguar in the commercial. <laughs> True. Yeah. It's like price you out before have... you even get in. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, this is clearly not for me. <laughs> All right. Let's move along to our next topic. Um, yeah, this is a whole story that's <laughs> kind of been a story for for a long time. So I Love. There was a recent, let me see if I can find it. Um, and Kevin, you're pretty quick. Uh, on Instagram, uh, the wire cutter uh, put up a post recently where there were a bunch of swords all kind of like pointing in as if they were all saying, yes, me too, me too, me too, me too. And it was all these different types of coffee drinkers. And they were all agreeing on a thing. Uh, this should be uh, probably Instagram.com slash wire cutter, um, I think is their, their uh, URL. But if it's the wire cutter, it could be that as well. Um, but I want to show this because I think that it per- perfectly kind of encap- in- encapsulates the, the, uh, the argument here. Everybody who knows what good coffee is knows that Keurig... Keurig, Keurig, <laughs> Krog, Krog coffee is bad. Krog coffee is the worst. And it is not only the worst because it tastes gross. It's, it's overly strong in a bad way. There's no uniqueness to the flavor. There's no layers. It's just water and mud. Um, everybody who drinks coffee, who cares about coffee, including as the, the post says, some Keurig owners probably know that Keurig coffee is bad, but also because of its stupid DRM practices where it doesn't want you buying coffee pods that cost less money uh, by getting a store brand or a a generic version. And they've got a huge licensing fee that they charge different coffee brewers to use uh, to, to, to sort of market for the Keurig brand. And so they started introducing a sensor in Keurig coffee machines that looks for a special ink on the top of the uh, coffee pod so that the Keurig machine will only work with Keurig coffee pods. So you can't buy third-party coffee pods unless you do some special magic to make it work or you just buy Keurig coffee pods. So it's bad coffee. It's expensive. It, for the (laughs) longest time, was very bad for the environment. It's now not as bad but still not good for the environment because of the um, the, the waste, uh, they've, they've tried to make that better, but it's still not great. And now Keurig, Keurig, Craig, Craig (laughs) is coming out with a Wi-Fi enabled coffee brewer that everybody is kind of saying, yeah, so where before it would just locally do a sensor to detect if you're using the right pod. Now I can connect to the internet and further it's DM, uh, it's it's well, um, it's not it's, that bad, what am I trying but... to say? DRM technology. I don't <laughs> trust Craig, and <laughs> I don't want 
an internet connected uh, coffee printer from Craig. <laughs> but tell me your thoughts because those are mine. <laughs> <laughs> also, it is interesting that it's Keurig Dr. Pepper Inc. Oh, yeah. No Dr. idea Pepper why that bought. they own. Yeah. That, yeah. But just an interesting branding choice, I guess, there. Um, I mean, I think the big thing about this one is they're like the custom smart has software that can recognize every one of the more than 800, eight, 800 pod varieties that they manufacture and make it work. So I think it's there is variety within their thing, but I'm not sure about the alternative thing. They kind of. Yeah, Maybe so it sounds to me they're trying to that, market but. it like, oh, we can do the right, um, the right heat level. We can do the right, uh, the right pull on the coffee. We can do the proper yeah. amount of water. We can do this. We can do that. If you let it connect to the internet, I get that, and I don't mind the idea of an internet connected. I should be clear. There's, um, I think it's called the Spin. Uh, I keep getting Instagram ads for it. And I really want it so bad, but it's not cheap. S-P-I-N-N um, is the name of this machine. And, oh, it's still in pre-order. I might have to pre-order this. Anyway, um, this is an internet-connected coffee machine, but it is not DRM'd. You know, you can put coffee in the top that you want to and make coffee how you want to with it. Uh, you, if you buy a coffee from them or do a coffee subscription from them, then it can, you can like scan the label and it will properly make it for that specific brew, that specific, uh, um, what am I trying to say? Not batch, but, uh, blend, but mm -hmm. you don't have to, and it doesn't do pods. So it's not, um, it doesn't have the environmental complaints that I have with Craig. So, <laughs> Excuse me, Craig, Dr. Pepper, um, Inc., TM, trademark, copyright. Anyway, I think that the spin, spinn.com, um, if Kevin wants to show it, is super cool and is the a way to show uh, how an internet-connected coffee machine can do good things and uh, like there's there's reason for it. But... Uh, Craig, Dr. Pepper Inc. doing it in the way that they're doing it. I don't feel, I don't know. I just don't feel jazzed about this company in general. They, they, I don't trust them. <laughs> and they, for the longest time, have done so much that just makes me feel icky. And look, I'm yeah. getting itchy. Um, so that's, that's my problem with it. Uh, I think as a whole, I think I'm, I'm not as upset about the DRM part because that's like clearly where they make their money. Like it isn't consumer friendly, but I don't, I trust them. I don't like distrust them. Probably <laughs> like, like I distrust too, ring huh? or something like that. Like where it's just actually creepy and things like that. So I, I, <laughs> I also never really reacted to your whole intro to this segment about just how Keurig is bad to you. Um, I think whatever it tastes bad. way it's bad for the environment. <laughs> I don't think it's great, but I will say, I mean, like I know somebody who owns a coffee shop who uses it because he just wants to make a cup of coffee in one minute. And if you can make, at least I with this names, product, you numbers, can make something, that's, I'm just <laughs> you can I'm make something that's closer to what you would want. Like, I think it does come down to tasting it. And I think the cost part is where it starts to, lose a lot of the benefit because once you get into fancier coffees, you're on some, I mean, maybe espresso stuff starts to change it when that you're not saving money, but like it is a cost thing that if you're going to get higher quality stuff, you want to spend less so that you're not just ever spending more money and buying a $400 machine plus all of the expensive pods and things like that starts to get like, if you're going to get, if you want fancy coffee, there's other solutions that might be more worth your money. So it's it's a whole thing, but I think it's still I I want to see. I mean, they even say that they only made a couple thousand of these, and a few years ago, they sent the equivalent of these that are one way into people's homes so that they could test the different pods and the varieties and like track that data to, in order to improve this product. So I want to see a two hundred dollar version of this and like beyond because. 
I don't like the trend of companies being like, here, the product's better. Now it's twice as expensive and <laughs> yeah. sort of destroys the whole proposition value. Just because it's smart doesn't mean I'm willing to pay twice as much money for it. So especially with coffee, this is like I'm, I'll pay more for the beans and the good stuff, not the hardware itself too. Like that eventually does fall apart. And if Keurig's beans and what they have in or grounds, I guess, aren't good enough, um, then it, it just comes out of that. If it doesn't taste good, it's not worth it. Buy an espresso machine. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, then there are other to your coffee shop friend. There are other pod coffee things that are so much better than Keurig. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just going to move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Roku is it, it kind of doing some moving and some shaking, I guess is the best way to put this, including a a new app that kind of puts Roku in different places uh, rather than just the hardware, which is kind of fun. Um, because I think Roku for a while has been kind of building out its Roku channel and sh- trying to show, hey, you know, we are more than just, we are more than just the sum of our devices, by golly. And now we have an app that has very good built-in content as well as premium add-ons like HBO and Showtime. I imagine this is what Roku would sound like if Roku had a voice. I don't know why, but it just seems appropriate. It's very breathy. <laughs> I mean, I think this is, and they they also are coming out with a, I thought this was a clever product, the Stream Bar, which is a basically a little desktop or a, what am I even it's thinking? It's a little of? The sound TV, bar. The TV hardware, yeah, but plus the sound bar included so you don't have to plug in multiple things. So that makes sense. I, I remember my grandparents had a Roku and it was all they really needed. It comes with AirPlay 2 now, so that's pretty cool. It's actually like in the realm That's of modern. types of stuff. So I think it, it makes sense, especially with the channel part, that if you have a Roku and you like it, you stick with it kind of situation. And we're beyond the point where people are watching television on their TV sets only. They Having the mobile app and things like that is you can get all around the house. I mean, it is, it's so funny seeing, especially now that we're in September, all of these companies like six months ago were, were like, oh my gosh, everybody's spending so much more time at home. We need to do this stuff now, like the the copy machine being more relevant and things like that now. So it's, I guess it's good to see Roku still kicking along. It did I, kind of yeah. seem like where, where are they going to go next? So this is kind of it, it seems like. <laughs> Goku. <laughs> I've got I've got a Roku um, television that I really like and I'm so pumped. Uh, it's TCL. I'm pumped that it could be getting um, AirPlay 2 and HomeKit support later this year. Oh. Uh, so I'm looking forward Great. to seeing how that works out because the wire cutter had recommended the TCL televisions as a, an inexpensive but still very good option for those who wanted to have HDR but not spend a bajillion dollars. And mm-hmm. um, I recently upgraded to the 4K Apple TV and have been watching almost exclusively HDR content on it. And um, it's beautiful. Uh, and it is, I'm excited, like I said, to add AirPlay 2 support and uh, all that other stuff as well without having to have spent, because I'm, I... Yeah, that's pretty solid. Not a huge television watcher enough to warrant, you know, the Samsung or LG 95,000 inch televisions. So I've got, you know, a smaller one in comparison to what uh, the standard, it seems, is like 50-something, 50, 50 inches or more. Yeah. I've just got like a 40-something inch, and it's enough for me. It's HDR, it's you know 4K, and it looks great, and it didn't cost me a trillion dollars. So um, I'm happy with that, and I'm happy that Roku continues to update and improve its products. Nice. Uh, Google held good. an event. Yeah. And actually, I want to I'm going to take a quick break before we talk about Google's event. How about that? Sure. How about that? Um, so I am excited to say 
that this episode of Smart Tech Today is brought to you by Molecule. We're all spending a lot more time indoors. <laughs> but did you know indoor air can be up to five times worse than outdoor air? I did know that, Molecule. I did. I know it. And it's awful. Ugh, according to the EPA, that's that's the EPA that says that. So, yeah, thank you, EPA. That's why Molecule is reimagining the future of clean air, starting with the air purifier. Thank God. We're sitting in our homes, sloughing off so much dead skin into the air. And if you have more than just you in the home, then you are also uh, breathing in the dead skin cells of the other people in your home and the animals in your home and the animals are shedding their hair and you're shedding other things from your body than just dead skin cells. And so everybody's just breathing in this gross concoction of dead human and dog and stink and fluff and stuff and gross. And we have to keep our doors closed. Or I mean, our windows closed because there's smoke outside. And so it's just a nightmare when I think about the air around me, or it would be if it wasn't for Molecule. See, Molecule is not just innovation on existing technology, but a scientific breakthrough in air purification. Molecule's core technology, PICO, or photoelectrochemical oxidation, actually destroys harmful pollutants in the air, like viruses, bacteria, mold, and chemicals, instead of just collecting them on filters. Molecule air purifiers are designed to help protect homes, businesses, and medical spaces so you know they're destroying pollutants and providing clean air. Molecule air purifiers are designed for large rooms up to 600 square feet. The Molecule Air Mini is designed for small rooms up to 250 square feet. The Molecule Air Mini Plus helps protect small rooms with a particle sensor and auto protect mode, which adjusts fan speed based on the sensor. And the new Molecule Air Pro RX is FDA cleared as a 510K class two medical device intended for medical purposes to destroy bacteria and viruses in the air. In independent testing, a molecule air purifier was shown to reduce concentration of MS2, a SARS-CoV-2 proxy virus, by over 99.9% in one hour. While it's important to maintain other good preventative practices, this is an extra layer of virus protection for your spaces. Molecules technology and filtration systems have been tested and verified by independent third-party labs for the whole home and beyond. The Molecule is a product that we always have in the studios at Twit. And I can remember last year when the fires were going on, turned on those Molecules uh, and got that got them rolling with the fires outside. And that uh, pretty soon you could no longer smell the smoke indoors. Uh, really nice to have that rolling along. So make sure you're not breathing in the dead skin cells of yourself and the other people in your home uh, day in and day out with these windows closed, doors closed, and all of us spending more time indoors due to uh, COVID-19. For 10% off your first air purifier order, visit Molecule.com and enter the code STT at checkout. That's M-O-L-E-K-U-L-E.com and enter the code STT. Thanks so much to Molecule for sponsoring this week's episode of Smart Tech Today. Google, Google, what's the Google news? Google has introduced new phones, new smart speaker, new Chromecast, and Google TV at Again. its event. That's right. <laughs> it is the Pixel 5 5G event, and uh, we've got new hardware from Google. Uh, in fact, that was covered as the a Twit event. Um, so you should definitely check out that as well if you want to see everything live while Leo and Jason are both covering it and sharing their thoughts and feelings on everything that was introduced. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's time to talk about the latest and greatest from Google. Um, my impression is that folks are kind of... Um, Underwowed by Google's Pixel 5. Um, but outside of that, some of the other technology that Google has introduced has got people pumped. Um, and so I, I find that interesting more than anything else is kind of where Google uh, where Google has shined and where it has maybe not let people down, but where people wished for more, I think, from the yeah. event. I do think Google's phone hardware 
is like trying to accomplish specific things for specific price points also. And some of that is more obvious with these phones um, and kind of just moving forward with the next generation of stuff. But I thought one of the interesting parts that they added in was the hold for me thing for the um, Google Assistant where you can have it wait on hold and then basically ping you when hold is the person on hold is over and you don't have to sit there and waste your time. Um, this is one of those weird ones that <laughs> my first reaction was just that if I was on the other side, I'd be annoyed. But also, I guess now that I think about it, they're being monitored for quality assurance so they can't <laughs> get annoyed. Uh, my reaction was if you were calling like a store where teenagers worked and Google Assistant was like, hi, you're on hold while they were like, it's like a reverse hold thing. So now the person who you were on hold with is now on hold for you. And I would just like hang up. <laughs> it's like, I'm not going to wait for this phone. What? Like, I think this is one of those things that would be very, very weird the first time it happens. Also, solid use of that technology. Yeah, I, I lost you there at the end a little bit, but I think okay. I, I think I picked up on it. Um, so this is that technology. I, I want this stuff to work because there is a part of me that's totally into um, not having to make phone calls or handle phone calls or anything like that, especially whenever it comes to tech support and whatnot. Uh, but I also, you know, I, I've got empathy um for folks who are in those places, you know, who have those jobs. And if the technology doesn't work right, I mean, they are constantly graded on their calls and interactions and things like that. And saying or not saying the right thing can lead to performance reviews that result in uh, payment loss, job loss. I mean, there's so much there. And so whenever I think about that, it does kind of make me wary of any of this technology because folks are trying their darndest um, in many cases, I know not in all cases, but in many cases to answer your questions and get the things done that you want done. And if that can't happen because of some silly, you know, uh, silly feature, I think that's, that's a bummer. So, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, Google TV is, Apple is, is akin to Apple TV. I just want to, the comparison is for folks who are on the Apple platform or have heard about Apple TV. Mm. Um, it's, you know, shows that you have, have purchased. It's the different apps like Hulu and YouTube and all of those brought together in one place. It's live TV. If you have, uh, if you have a YouTube TV subscription with live. Um, so yeah, I mean, you can just kind of think about it as, uh, one place to gather all of the television stuff. And it's of course great for cord cutters. Um, and that pairs mm -hmm. well with Google's new, uh, Chromecast that has Google TV built into it, uh, available for 49 99. Uh, this device has a remote, um, it, it's kind of reminiscent of a uh, Roku. Um, to me, mm -hmm. it comes with the, the HDMI cord that, HDMI cord with a little dongle or the little uh, oval on the end of it. You plug that into your television and then it has a remote with a YouTube and Netflix shortcut as well as a uh, Google Assistant shortcut. So you can talk to it and have it show you your stuff. So you buy that, you get Google TV um, on there as well. And you can kind of use it as you would an Apple TV or a Roku box uh, all together. So mm -hmm. I think... Firestick. Yeah, or an, yeah, thank you. Or an Amazon Fire Stick. Um, I know a lot of people who love their Chromecast devices. Um, my mom is one of them, and so this as an extension of that, I think, is uh, it's it's cool <laughs> uh, that yep. they are improving upon that. I, it is a <laughs> like Google TV originally was Google TV, then went to Android TV, and is now back. So they've done that whole loop that Google is fairly notorious for. I'm fascinated with Google TV specifically and Netflix because if they have Netflix in their up next queue kind of thing, whatever it is, I'm not happy about that because we don't have that on <laughs> Apple TV. And right. Darn it. that's like my brain is telling me 
we're going to get that at the Apple event that comes next. Like some sort of, there's supposed to be another Apple event and they haven't mentioned Apple TV or anything. So I could see that being a good clapping line basically is, yeah. Hey, and now we finally and got Netflix, Netflix on Apple on. TV. So yeah. if we don't get that, I'm going to be more upset. Um, <laughs> but at least with the Chromecast thing, um, there's an article in here from Moto. It's like, Big tech finally figured out that phones aren't the best devices for streaming, um, <laughs> which is good because I that was one thing that I always I enjoy being able to cast from my phone to the Chromecast stuff that's built into my TV. And I use the Nest Hub stuff all the time. Um, but just having to do that in order to even use it at all seems a little bit weird. And I did see someone on Twitter, though, who was saying so if you look at the Google Chromecast remote, there's no dedicated play pause button and it's all built into the trackpad. And basically oh. he said every app chooses how to do that differently. And so Oh no, that's so true. Yeah. No universal. I was, he was like, I can't play. give this to my family because no. my partner can't has sing one thing in one app. Yeah, and my partner just um, has God, yeah. fits daily because he uh, doesn't usually use the hardware controls. He uses the trackpad on the Apple TV to do everything. And, of course, that results in lots of frustration. Um, and so I can't imagine yeah, exactly. on a device that doesn't have that what that would result in for people. Uh, what kind of – what level of frustration that would result in for people for sure. Yeah. Like they have a mute button, but no pause or any sort of volume controls built in, which makes sense depending on the hardware. But the Apple TV remote is like play, pause, volume controls, and then the trackpad does more. So it's, <laughs> I don't want to like declare it, but even from the guy who I saw is a, I guess he's more of an Amazon type person. But the fact that Google somehow might have made a remote worse than the Apple TV remote is is a feat who knew it <laughs> because was possible people really don't like that one i actually think it's fine that's okay but <laughs> in the year of our lord 2020 actually i can believe that it's possible <laughs> yeah. it has happened um something that folks have been very bullish on is app Apple, google's new um nest audio this mm -hmm. it looks what does it look like it looks like it looks like you take like a home pod and squished it on two sides. You could say that. I was thinking it looks like a like a case for two pairs of glasses. It's like the <laughs> folks who want to have their sunglasses and their reading glasses in one case. Um, and then they would open it up and they would both be inside. It has that feel to it. But um like it comes in some stuff. really <laughs> Yeah. It comes in some really pretty colors. Um and People really do <laughs> seem to to like uh, the the audio quality. So it's uh, supposed to be seventy five percent louder, uh, fifty percent stronger bass than the original Google Home, um, which I mean you could measure anything into original Google Home and get flying colors. Um, cool. It's got a nineteen millimeter tweeter. Oh man, that sounds nice. Nineteen millimeter tweeter uh, for consistent high frequency coverage and clear vocals, and a seventy five millimeter mid woofer. Uh, that brings the bass. Now, they Google says that it has done 500 hours of tuning to ensure balanced lows, mids, and highs. And from the reviews that I've read so far, that is really shining through. Um, it's got a custom-designed tweeter and optimized grill with fabric and materials that help uh, stop any distortion uh, from happening. So... They really were with this device trying to create a a product that takes takes things home when it comes to audio quality. Um, there's also a better um, assistant built into it. It's going to be faster because it's got a dedicated machine learning chip, which is something that Amazon recently introduced with theirs. Um, so yeah, I think that this is once again you've got these these. There's a little shift forward with one company in the smart speaker arena, and then the other company quickly catches up um, or slightly pushes things forward. And then the companies continue to sort of uh, uh, lightly edge each other out or get right to uh, mm -hmm. parallel on all of these different things. And so this feels like that in terms of matching, not matching, um, but 
getting to a quality of audio where they can really say, you know, this is a speaker that you're going to love to have in your home. So matching Apple in that, and then also matching Amazon in we've got an assistant that's going to be fast. It's going to uh, respond to you quickly. It's going to know what you need and do as much locally as it can, um, as well as making adjustments uh, like the HomePod does. So it's, uh, it says Nest Audio also adapts to your home. Media EQ feature enables Nest Audio to automatically tune itself to whatever you're listening to. Ambient IQ lets Nest Audio also adjust the volume of assistant news podcasts and audio bu- books based on the background noise in your home so you That's can funny. hear the weather forecast over a noisy dishwasher. Plus, Google and Nest have both been killing it on um, – whole home audio. And this is just the latest, uh, to do a stream transfer, um, and multi-room control so that you can, you know, adjust the sound and audio and what's playing on multiple devices. So all of this, I think makes for what's going to be a, a very good product that, uh, so far folks have just been loving, um, in talking about it. And I like all the colors. I got to always give a little uh, shout out to the colors. It's available for $99.99, a uh, hundred bucks as of today yeah. um, in the US, Canada, and India. And uh, it'll be on shelves in Target, Best Buy, and more on October 15th. So, yeah, started uh, shipping today. And I think that it's, uh, I think that Google has really released a product that I, uh, I'm quite excited about. Yeah, that seems solid. I think even I haven't seen one in person. I only see a bunch of their ads, so maybe I should look at and watch some videos on these. But um, I think it said it's like comparable to the size of an iPhone. So it looks in photos looks huge to me, but doesn't seem as big as it might look. And I do think it's a a huge design change from the air freshener look of the original one, yeah. which I forgot. I would love to have. <laughs> two of these on the left and right side of, you know, a, 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 a television versus the original weird, uh, conical yeah. flat conical air freshener plateau yeah. nonsense. <laughs> that was the, the original, um, Google home. Um, and then the mini kind of took a step in this direction, but I think a lot of them were just underpowered and it seemed like, a lot of the first era of these smart speakers was focused on the smart and now it's focused on the speaker more. Um, mm-hmm. that, that was kind of one of the things that the reverse of Apple. Well, it just always annoyed me when I started with, with those echoes and things like that is I could tell I would have to buy a new one basically now because it wasn't, they made them cheap so that they were affordable, but they were cheap products and now need to be upgraded. And even just the environmental impact of that sucks. Like there's no doubt about it that it's something that's designed to last for 10, I mean, specifically speakers. Some people have them for 30 to 50 years of like the real home audio stuff. And so these are throwaway products, unfortunately, at a certain level that will be in a landfill. I mean, maybe you can just keep them, keep rocking it forever, um, which is fine too, especially now. I still have my original Echo. (laughs) Yeah. Um, this generation I'd say is more worthy of keeping around for that long. But I, I'm not as totally long as they have a the stereo designs. output, like, yeah, I mean, tooth connectivity, then you know, at least for a while we'll have so. it. <laughs> oh, say I what? See. Just that I was, I was just joking that the home doesn't even have that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, which is, but annoying. I bought that knowing that I would have it for 10 years because it was good enough. Um, and the sound quality was high enough that, it would be worth keeping around that long as opposed to kind of getting something for now. But I think it's also like this does seem the price point in the feature mix seems like a really good product. I, I don't know if I like the design though. I don't having two of those like wide chunky things sitting around doesn't. Oh, I like it. It just looks weird. I don't know why to me. Something about it just seems like a column that's just kind of standing in the middle of nowhere. Whereas when they're actually rounded, they're like... I guess it's just because I feel like it's not trying to hide that it's a speaker. I I get annoyed whenever a product is like, I am not this thing. 
yeah. it's just it because it's but speakers don't directly look like out this. at you. It so looks like, like a that's speaker. What, it doesn't look like a speaker to me, I guess, on from the side or the front. It looks like really it's it is. I mean, I've never seen a speaker that's that shape. Yeah, it's something well, about the rounded edges to me. Like I, it's like trying edges, to be a home bod and it's trying to be a different thing. And like, uh, I don't know. I'm just imagining one of those on either side of my desk looks weird. Like <laughs> you want it to, it's, you want it to be that it's trying to be something instead of just that it's just being itself. Yeah. But even then as a speaker, I have speakers all around my house and the Sonos one stands alone. The home pod stands alone and they don't, I feel like this is like you see a wall of fabric material on in the front or on the side. It's like weirdly thin and shaped. So I'm not sure. It's just a personal preference thing yeah, too. Yeah. Like it is a weird, yeah. I don't, I can't think of anything that exists that, how do you describe this? There's nothing that looks like this. So like it's super unique, but to me it just is like, so it's a piece of tech that, draws attention to itself as a speaker as opposed to fades into the environment. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to agree to disagree on that. Cause I feel like there are, it's instead of being a straight up rectangular prism, like a normal speaker, they softened the top edges of it so that it does kind of blend in. Your eye doesn't catch on it. It feels feng shui or feng shui, feng, feng shui it's very, um, versus being very stoic and, and stick out. And so that's that's how I feel it blends in better, but still has that speaker shape. But I think we'll have to agree to disagree on that. Uh, we do need to skip ahead to our picks of the week. Matthew, what is your pick of the week? Mine is the deliveries app. And like I was almost suspicious if I stole this from you because I know that I'm pretty sure you like this one too. But um, they just got a major update today to version, or not today. Sorry, I was reading <laughs> off the headline. Uh, they got a major update to version 9.0, and it's another solid iteration for this company that has been around for a long time. They're doing an, a whole new business model system where they have a new subscription service, but also you get a complimentary access to it if you already purchased the app and things like that for a while. So I love this app, especially during right what's coming up is amazon prime day black friday oh, and christmas shoot. season and just amazon. like knowing where your packages are that they're not about to be stolen off of your front porch <laughs> or just to the i mean there's a whole psychological thing where the anticipation of something nice is makes you feel almost as good as something arriving yeah. like getting the Christ, like anticipating christmas feels just as good as christmas day and if this app can kind of reinforce that in a good way that seems generally not super toxic, like maybe capitalism, yeah, Ruha is not the best thing, but also if I'm going to buy the thing, I want to know when it's coming and understand it'll show you like the steps of the process and things like that too. So I highly recommend yeah, this. I use it every day. Um, so I am a thousand percent on board with, uh, this as a, as a pick of the week for sure. Um, yeah. So if you've bought it already, then you can get it. Uh, but it's a 99 cent per month subscription or only four ninety nine per year. Um, yeah. that is incredibly, incredibly, uh, cost effective and awesome. I went for the 499 per year, uh, just so I could kick some money over to the developer sooner. Um, but what I love now, one of my, one of my favorite features is that, uh, before you had to choose iCloud syncing or June cloud syncing, which June cloud is the name of the company that makes, uh, or I should say the name of the agency that makes this app. Um, and, I, one, you chose one or the other and then it would sync everything, but now you can use both. And so you can do iCloud syncing for some of the, like the immediate back and forth stuff where a June cloud will be more of the settings and stuff across the different devices that you have. And so now I've got both turned on and it's so much better that way. Whereas before when I would, uh, open mm. up deliveries on a new app and log in, uh, some, uh, some repeats would show up. I'd have to adjust settings and stuff like that now. Mm. Uh, cause like I said, I just had to get a new machine and everything is where it's supposed to be and what I want it to be, um, on 
on my device. And I, I love that. Um, so yeah, nice. this is, if you, I should say, um, if you live in the United States or the UK, uh, particularly, this is a fantastic app for tracking deliveries. Um, I have, I've heard some complaints about, uh, other regions. And yeah. so I can't speak for, you know, an international audience, but certainly if you live in the United States and you get more than one package a week, um, if you get more than one package every two weeks, uh, this is an app that you should totally check out. It's only gotten better. I get uh, more up to the minute uh, notifications for packages. It has a new feature that lets you import a bunch of uh, deliveries all at once. Um, it's just a great app for keeping track of stuff. So definitely check it out. Um, my, my pick of the week is a, it's an indulgence. Um, I've <laughs> mentioned it before, uh, I had a first edition Ember mug. Um, Ember mug is this self-heating mug. Uh, it has a battery built into it, and essentially it will it, – it it's not meant to warm up a beverage. What it's meant to do is keep a beverage at a temperature for – your, you know, for as long as you want it to. And so you can brew a cup of coffee and you want that coffee to remain at 140 degrees, but maybe you don't want to drink your coffee right away. You want it to be able to last throughout, you know, six hours or eight hours or something like that. Um, this keeps it at 140 degrees until the battery runs out. Or if you keep it on the coaster, then it'll just stay that way. Um, it is a very awesome device that is not inexpensive and is absolutely a, uh, it, it's, it's a treat. <laughs> it is not anything that I need, but it is something that I want and I am happy to have. And I'm, I'm glad that I gave my, um, gay, like that I took some of my earned money and gave myself this gift. Um, I had the Ember mug first edition. It was a white one. I think it was 10 ounces and Ember came out with the second edition of its product and offered a larger size, 14 ounces instead of 10. And so I upgraded to the 14 ounce size and I pretty much use this all day. I'll have a cup of coffee, uh, at the beginning of the day. And then I usually have some sort of like a chamomile or a, a ginger or some sort of, um, herbal caffeine free tea at night. And this is like, there's coffee in this right now that I brewed earlier today and it's still 140 degrees Fahrenheit. And so it's got steam coming off of it and everything. Um, and it's great too for, for brewing tea, you know, you brew it at a higher level, same thing with coffee. It, it brewed at, um, what, uh, a hundred degrees Celsius when it went in, but over time you can track the temperature dropping to your, uh, desired temperature. And then it will notify you and say, Hey, your coffee's at 140 degrees now. So you can, you know, you're ready to go. And then it'll keep it at 140 as long as there's battery or you just sit it on. Let me see if I can get this over here. Um, a coaster that it comes with. And as long as it's on the coaster, it will keep that charge. Um, my one complaint is that in uh, Ember Mug 2, they kept these pogo pins. Um, my first edition model, the pogo pins, and one of the pogo pins went bad. Pogo pins are these little uh, metal pins that have a spring inside of them. And so whenever you set something on top of it, it's sort of the spring keeps the contact in place. So it will keep pressing up. And so as you set something down, if it presses down more, the spring will kind of uh, squish or depress, mm -hmm. but it will still keep those pins pressed up against the bottom because it has uh, little metal rings on the bottom that it actually touches to to charge it. But sometimes those um, pogo pins can, the spring inside can get ruined and then the pins don't lift anymore. Um, and so that happened with my first edition uh, coaster. And I ended up um, just taking the pins out and doing some custom soldering and stuff like that to get it working again. But what I've heard from other people who have these Ember mugs is that Ember is very good about if whoops if the pogo pins go bad, they will give you a coaster replacement. Um, but I would just think that you know maybe go for mm -hmm. a better design that doesn't require the uh, pogo yeah. pins. But until then, that works. Um, 
it's $130 for a 14 ounce mug that keeps your coffee or tea or whatever you have in it, latte hot for the entire day. That's a lot of money for, a, uh, yeah. for a, a, a heater, but it is one of my favorite things. <laughs> uh, to be frank, it is one of my favorite things. I love this mug. I loved the first one, um, the ten ounce one. I, this is the next generation one, the fourteen ounce one, and I am like no regrets at all. Uh, yeah, there. Really quick, I just was going to say I've seen some reviews online for it not um, being uh, good, and from what I can see it ends up being that people are having Bluetooth issues with it. And I think I hate to say this cause I'm not normally the person who wants to say that it's uh, what is it between the keyboard and the, the uh, yeah. chair error, but that's what this feels like. And so what I would say is if you know how to Bluetooth connect to something with your phone <clears throat> and know the typical troubleshooting steps of toggling off and on Bluetooth again, um, I've not had Probably. any issues with mine at all. Uh, it's worked perfectly and no complaints. Um, the pogo pins in this one are lasting, uh, and everything's good. So yeah, the, you know, always read the reviews, always take the reviews into consideration, but just know that I don't recommend a product that I is a bad thing. Um, and I'm always mm -hmm. conscious of that. And if there's something that I don't like about something, Craig, Dr. Pepper Inc., you know that I would tell you that uh, very Fair. clear about that kind of thing. So I'm not recommending this because they're, you know, secretly paying me or something. I genuinely like this product and it makes me happy and has worked yeah. fine for me. Um, and I'm, I feel bad that like, there are bad reviews out there. <laughs> it seems like one of those things that it's like a hard price to get past, but once you have it, then you're like, Oh yeah, this is awesome. Like it's not yeah. a need to have, but it's a really nice to have. And Yes, I saw when I saw this version too. I was like, oh, I've been, I I want to like treat myself with some <laughs> tech toy thing. So I might this might be in my near future. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so nice. Ugh. All right, folks. Um, we are. Pro I think we'll for the next episode. Uh, I need to write this down somewhere. We're gonna. We should do a feedback uh, episode, a questions sure. episode. Uh, I've gotten a few questions and some feedback and things like that. So if you have had a question for us, a project that you wanted to work on or something like that, now's the time. Send that in. Stt at twit tv. Just simple three letters. Stt at twit tv. Um, you can tune in live to the show because we record it live every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific. Uh, you head to just twit.tv slash live to check it out. But the best way to get the show is by subscribing to the show, twit.tv slash stt, where you can subscribe to the show in audio and video formats. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all the places that uh, you want to be, we are there. Uh, and you can subscribe to the show and in those ways. Matthew Castanelli, if folks want to follow you online and check out the great work you're doing, where do they go to do that? Uh, you can go to matthewcastanelli.com, check out my shortcuts catalog, my membership, which has now been out for one month, which is amazing. Thank you, everyone, for the support. And then I've been sending my weekly newsletter, What's New in Shortcuts, is going to go out on Sundays from now on. So... Yeah, lots to keep up with. Lots of fun shortcuts. One of them is how to keep up with the news right now because <laughs> things are, I was like, oh no, it's been two hours and I haven't checked the news. Like, oh God, what's what's in store for us once we sign up? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, I got my, uh, I think it was just this morning, I got my email for my renewal to the membership. And then shortly after that, your um, email came through for what's new and shortcuts. So it was nice. It was like, oh, nice. ding, you're good. And then boom. I get the email from you from the thing that you promised. And so uh, you are holding up your end of the bargain and I appreciate it. <laughs> that's that's good um, to hear. I'm always scared. <laughs> And then for me, you can find me at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social media networks, or you can head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where there are links and um, QR codes for all of the different places you can find me online. Uh, I think that's going to do it for this week. All that's left is to say good afternoon to all of our smart assistants. Good afternoon, chaps. <laughs> Good day. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I am Ant Pruitt, host at Twit TV. Got a question for you. 
Have you gotten tired of how bad your photos are looking every time you post them to Instagram? Better yet, have you gotten yourself a new camera and you can't quite figure out why the images just don't look that good? Well, I have a solution for you. This is my show, Hands On Photography. Each and every Thursday, I sit down and share different tips and tricks that are gonna help make you a better photographer and a better post processor. So subscribe today at twit.tv hop to learn more.